All right, everybody. Last class of the semester, huh? You made it. Almost, I guess you've got like quizzes and finals and stuff. Almost there. Uh, I remember joking recently, it feels like that, like we're over the hump, the semester's almost over. We're in the home stretch now, back in uh, January, which feels like 200 years ago, but also feels like last week. It's kind of weird. Every semester is like that. You made it last lecture. We're going to pick up with the respiratory system today. Uh, your class program for today had some reading and a short video, the usual. Um, no more class programs. So that's all done. We're going to wrap things up today with the respiratory system. And then I've got some uh, details about what to expect for the rest of the week at the end of class. So before we get to that, uh, the Department of Biological Sciences, which is formerly uh, the Botany Microbiology Department and the Zoology Department are now one unified department. We're having our picnic tomorrow afternoon from four to six over at Blue Limestone. Everyone is welcome. Um, so come on over. And I love this slide because I like a good biology pun. All right, so today's agenda, we're gonna do a review with drawing. We couldn't have a last class without it. I know many of you have been emailing me asking for more pictures, so I just wanted to accommodate that. We're gonna continue the respiratory system and then more on the respiratory system. And then I've got some reminders uh, about the schedule and then a final ticket out for today as well. So before we jump in, questions? Yes, please. So uh, we had like the last slide, but I Actually, I have lecture start off today with trachea. We're going to review those last couple slides. So we'll get to that. And if you have questions after we do that, let me know. Mm -hmm. Other questions? All right, let's do review. Two minutes. Go ahead and draw this diagram and label the missing uh, pieces. What I left on there are parts of the respiratory system we haven't quite gotten to yet. Um, so you're not expected to know those yet, but I want you to see these on the diagram. Um, everything in blue is what we covered on Friday. So give it a shot. You know the format at this point. All right, so what you have here are the major structures of the upper respiratory tract. And so just as a quick reminder, remember air first enters through the nostril and then enters the nasal cavity. It then moves back to the pharynx. Now remember there are three parts of the pharynx. Do you remember what those three parts are? Nasal pharynx, pharynx. Yep, the nasopharynx, laryngopharynx, and oropharynx. It's not on here, but we'll, well, we covered that in credit. Then air moves down in, into the larynx, which is also known as your voice box, and then down into the trachea. The trachea then bifurcates into your two primary bronchi, left and right, and then those further branch off into smaller and smaller bronchi, uh, bronchi 
We're going to talk about those today. But this upper respiratory uh, tract up down through the trachea is what we covered on Friday. And just remember those major structures. Just by way of reminder, there's three very important things that happen um, as air comes through this part of the system. What are those three things? The air is, Brooke? Filtered, warmed, and one more, sure. Humidified. humidified, good. Filtered, warmed, humidified. There's one thing that absolutely does not happen in your upper respiratory tract. Although it's an essential, it's why we breathe, but it does not happen in any of these structures. And what is that thing that doesn't happen? Gas no gas exchange, exactly. No gas exchange instead, or not instead, but uh, rather the air is humidified, warmed, and cleaned or filtered. So our respiratory system generally involves uh, four processes. This is review I covered on Friday, but just by way of refresher. We have pulmonary ventilation. Then we have external respiration. So pulmonary ventilation is the air moving in and out of the lungs. Basically, everything we're going to talk about in the respiratory system is by, on this first uh, function. But I want you to know the entire, um, all four of these functions, because they all are essential for the respiratory system to do its job. The second function is external respiration. So this is gas exchange in the lungs, in the alveoli. O2 is absorbed into the bloodstream and uh, CO2 is dumped off. Then those gases are transported throughout the body. This is the job of what system? Circulatory, circulatory system, yep. And your blood, of course, which is part of the circulatory system. And then we have what's called internal respiration, which is gas exchange between the blood and the tissues where um, that oxygen is needed. What I wanna point out here, some important kind of technical distinction is we often use the term respiration kind of in the vernacular to mean like to breathe. It really doesn't mean that. In anatomical physiological terms, it has a very specific meaning about gas exchange in these two places. Rather, we use the term ventilation for what you commonly call breathing. So just keep that in mind as you're working through that. Ventilation is what we commonly call breathing. Respiration has a very specific meaning in this context. We looked through the major organs of this system and we divided these organs into two major groups, the conducting zone, which is what we've been talking about so far. Remember, filter, humidify, warming, incoming air. And then the respiratory zone is where the gas exchange, external gas exchange actually happens, uh, external rep resp uh, respiration in the lungs. We're gonna cover this today. Just by way of further review on Friday, we wrapped up talking about the trachea. And I want to sh make sure you've got this diagram. And one thing that I had omitted this diagram from lecture on Friday intentionally, because it has all of these cartilages, there's nine cartilages of the larynx. I'm not going to cover that. You don't need to know that. Um, with the exception of the um, carina, which we'll get to uh, in a little bit. That's a little bit, bit of cartilage down in the trachea, although that's not part of the larynx. But you don't need to worry about any of these. But when I omitted this diagram, this diagram does have one structure I do want you to know, and that is this epiglottis. Remember this epiglottis is this little flap that closes over your trachea when you swallow so that food and water don't go down your trachea. Now, as you know, it doesn't work perfectly. Sometimes you, uh, if you're laughing unexpectedly or you take a quick breath or you try to talk while you're chewing something, stuff can go down your trachea. And that's generally uh, a very bad thing, especially if that thing gets lodged in the trachea and especially more so if it obstructs airflow. And that's where, uh, that's what choking is. If something goes down, your epiglottis doesn't do its job right, and something goes down the trachea. So the trachea, um, we talked about this. Uh, I'm just going to go through this, is just review from Friday again. Remember, that's the structure that descends into the mediastinum, which is this cavity between your uh, lungs and your um, superior thoracic cavity. Remember, it has these C-shaped cartilage rings that help give it structure. Remember the cartilage rings continue laterally, anteriorly, and then laterally again, but there's no cartilage posteriorly because we have a special smooth muscle called the trachealis. I do want you to know that. And that is the posterior wall of the trachea. And that's the wall essentially between the trachea and the esophagus. And this gives your trachea a little bit of flexibility, right? If, the, um, if you're swallowing something really large in your esophagus, um, the trachealis can expand into the trachea to give the esophagus a little more room. At the same time, if you're trying to expel a bunch of air really rapidly with a cough or a sneeze or a scream, that trachealis can expand posteriorly and expand the trachea and allow a little more room for airflow. So the cartilage is essential to give it structure, but if you want to have any flexibility, 
um, where that comes from the posterior wall of the trachea, the trachealis. And then finally, just a little landmark here, the carina is this little ridge of cartilage that marks where the, the, the inferior most end of the cartilage, excuse me, of the trachea, where the trachea divides into those two primary bronchi. And so I'll just back up here for a second, just to orient you. Oh, I'm gonna go way back here. That carina is this little bit of cartilage right here. So that's the trachea. I know I covered it on Friday. I just wanna make sure we got that. Hannah, go ahead. This is not the other one, but what is just like the glottis? Uh, okay, the glottis is, where is this on here? I missed that. Yeah. Um, oh, it's not labeled on this diagram. Let me just see if I have that on this diagram. It'd be easier just to show you. The glottis is basically just that opening. Um, so epi meaning on top of, and so it just means on top of that opening. And I just want to see if I have a way to show that to you easily. Oh, shoot. No, I don't have that on a diagram, but it's just the opening. So the epiglottis is essentially the covering for that opening. Hmm. Got ahead. Uh, well, in this case, it's the, it's the opening for the trachea, so it's okay. the opening of the airway. Yep, and the epiglottis covers that when you, when you do your swallowing. Yep, good question. Any others? We'll have to know that's the rib of the dorsal nerve. Say again? We'll have to know that's the rib of the dorsal nerve. Uh, we did talk about that, yep. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, okay, transverse section of your trachea. So this is that C-shaped cartilage. Remember, this is made of highline cartilage. We cover that in lab. And then this posterior wall is the smooth muscle, this trachealis. And then you have the esophagus posterior. We looked at the slide of this. Again, this is a uh, review of lab as well. So you've seen this in lab and lecture already. Um, but I want to continue into the trachea um, and get into the uh, respiratory zone here. So the trachea, as I said, bifurcates into the left main bronchus or left primary bronchus and the right primary bronchus. Um, from there, what I want you to know is that those bronchi further bifurcate into smaller and smaller bronchi. Plus, you don't need to know the names of all of these individual bronchi, although you can see here you have, it's kind of logical, you have the secondary bronchi and then the tertiary bronchi. Um, what I want you to know is you have the two primary left and right bronchi, they bifurcate a bunch of times, they get smaller and smaller. And finally, they divide into what's called bronchioles. These are like the really, really small bronchi uh, down in here. And then those further divide into what's called terminal bronchioles. So big bronchi, go to little bronchi, go to bronchioles, go to terminal bronchioles. Note that you have two lobes of your left lung and three lobes in your right lung. And the reason for that is because your heart takes up a little more space on the left-hand side of your uh, chest. And you can kind of see how this lung is shaped a little bit like this to accommodate the heart, which kind of leans towards the left a little bit. And so we've only got two lobes on our left and four, on, or excuse me, and three on our right. Remember on the cat, this was different. The cat had actually four on its right side and three on its left. So it still had less on its left. It just has one more on either side uh, compared to us. And I can show you these bifurcating bronchi in a little more detail here. Again, you don't need to know all of these details. The takeaway message from here is that in either lung, left and right, these bronchi bifurcate and bifurcate and bifurcate and get smaller and smaller and smaller. Mm -hmm. From the cat, those lobes were pretty separate. Like they kind of uh -huh. were like peeled apart. Uh -huh. Is that how it is in our body? Uh -huh. I'm actually gonna show you a video table going inflating and you'll see that. Yep, that's exactly how it is. And then when they remove, like um, in the case of cancer, lung cancer or something like that, they can remove that whole lung. And that kind of facilitates the ability to remove like that lobe and then leave the other lobe there. Mm -hmm. So are there not bronchi that go like from one lobe to another? No, they don't. They kind of stay, well, I don't know. This diagram shows kind of like they do, but my, my understanding is that they don't. So don't pay attention to the way that looks. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, so do the terminal bronchioles have the alveoli on 
We're going to get there in a second. Yep, hold that thought. Just a couple slides ahead of me. If you look at a cross section of um, a bronchus under uh, in a microscope, we can see here that we have this pseudo stratified epithelia. So that's come up a bunch of times. Remember, those are those ciliated pseudo stratified uh, columnar epithelial cells. And in this case, their cilia, uh, let's say in the bronchus, are those cilia moving stuff up? Or are they moving stuff down? Up, why, Erica? Exactly. So does it move further down into your lungs and get into the alveoli, but rather comes up and goes up and goes up, and eventually you can cough it up and then swallow it, and it's all good in your digestive system. Good. The lumen, of course, here, you've seen this word a bunch of times this semester. This is just like the central opening uh, of this, in this case, of the bronchus. Mm -hmm. So the, the, the cilia, when you're breathing, they go, they like curve upwards and collect stuff or what? Like what's... They kind of catch stuff as it comes down, but then their action overall is to move stuff up and out of your lungs. Okay. Mm -hmm. they're, they're constantly kind of trying to get stuff up. Notice here on all of these bronchi, we do have these cartilaginous structures, kind of like rings around it too. This gives these uh, structures a, a, a rigidity because that pressure is constantly changing as you inhale and exhale, and that allows them to maintain uh, their structure. And we talked about that with the trachea. It's the exact same idea. So to return to where we started in the very beginning, we talked about the conduction zone being, uh, including the nose, nasal cavity, cavity, pharynx, larynx, trachea, and the bronchi. Now we can expand that and we know this in much more detail. It's the nose, the nasal cavity. Then we divided the um, pharynx into the nasopharynx, the oropharynx, the laryngopharynx. Then we have the larynx, the trachea. And then we have those two primary bronchi, then the secondary bronchi, tertiary bronchi, bronchioles, terminal bronchioles. And that's gonna take us down to the respiratory zone. So all the way from the nose to the bronchioles, that kind of rhymes actually, um, is the uh, conducting zone. And we have to know this in pretty good detail right now. And then I wanna talk a little bit here about the respiratory zone. And this is the last thing we're gonna cover in the entire semester. Questions so far? Okay. Well, let's talk about these respiratory bronchioles. Um, so these, your bronchioles are covered with smooth muscle and that smooth muscle um, can expand and contract or dilate and, and constrict these bronchioles under different conditions. Where we don't have smooth muscle in those terminal bronchioles, there is some, um, there is some gas exchange but primarily, these terminal bronchioles lead to what I'm going to call a, what's called an alveolar duct, which then has a bunch of alveolar sacs off the end of it. And you can think of this, it's very much analogous to a bunch of grapes, where you have these kind of bifurcating stems. In this case, those are the bronchioles. And then you have a cluster of grapes at the end of each of those stems, in this case, analogous to these alveoli. Now, the alveoli are the important structures where almost all of the gas exchange happens. I'm gonna talk about them in a little more detail, but I just wanna make sure you've got this overall structure uh, first, how these terminal bronchioles branch into the alveolar ducts, and those lead to these, these essentially these little spheres that inflate and deflate called alveoli. Mm -hmm. So this is a part of the respiratory zone? This, the, uh, yes, now you're looking at the respiratory zone, yep. Um, so I want to talk about alveoli a little bit here, uh, actually a little bit more than normal even. Um, these guys are super cool. So if you took all of the surface area of your alveoli and flattened it out somehow, um, you'd be dead. Uh, also, it would be very large. It'd be, I think that it's like the size of like a tennis court, right? So that means every time you inhale, you take a breath, right? That air is spread out over the surface area, something the size of a tennis court. Uh, so that you can exchange gases. And the greater the surface area, the more gases you can exchange. And so these provide for this huge surface area. In addition to surface area, gas exchange is determined by the thickness of the membranes through which it needs to pass. And in this case, the thinner, well, in all cases, the thinner the membrane, the, um, the easier it is to exchange gases. So these alveoli are made up of this single layer of these uh, squamous epithelial cells that provide this very thin 
uh, layer of tissue through which gas is exchanged because uh, it only has to pass through this one layer of cells and then one layer of cells forming the endothelium of your capillaries. And then boom, gas can move between these air spaces in here and your blood. Just as a reminder, this is external respiration. So even though this is happening in your lungs and these alveoli, it's considered external because that air in your alveoli is external environmental air, right? It's coming into your body, um, but it's still in, in this air passageway. It's not happening uh, within the tissues of your body. It's where, where O2 enters uh, your bloodstream. There's two types of cells in the alveoli. The type one alveolar cells are these simple squamous epithelial cells. And they're surrounded by a very thin layer, a very thin uh, basal lamina uh, layer, and that forms this respiratory membrane. So this is, the, this is where gas exchange happens. This is if you stretched all these out or flattened all them out, uh, you'd get something like the size of a tennis court, which is kind of incredible. I mean, you figure if you're in, inhaling like, um, let's do a visual for a second. Let's say you're inhaling like two liters of air with every breath, right? That's like two of these bottles. Now imagine spreading that across the area of a tennis court, right? So imagine taking two bottles of water and evenly distributing it across the, a tennis court. You'd have a layer of water that was like basically nothing. It would be super thin. And that's exactly what, what's happening every time you take that breath. You're spreading all of that air, two, three liters of it across these membranes that are the size of a tennis court so that you can really exchange gases not, um, not only uh, efficiently, but also rather quickly. Mm -hmm. If something gets into the membrane to the alveolar, alveoli, like say B thoughts or something like that, can it get out at that point, or is it once it's in there, it's in there? Um, it, well, actually, hold that thought because you got little little helper guys that are called macrophages that are cleared out. Let me get to that actually. So there's three kinds of cells I want you to know in the alveoli. You have type one alveolar cells. This is the simple squamous epithelial cells. Then we have what's called type two cells. Type two cells are kind of scattered along this, um, this surface and they are cuboidal epithelial cells. And what they do is secrete something called surfactant. Uh, surfactant is awesome. When I teach physiology, I spend a lot of time with this because uh, you couldn't be alive without it. And in fact, the discovery of surfactant and the ability to produce artificial surfactant saved hundreds and thousands of lives of babies that were born prematurely. Because what happens when babies are born prematurely, they're born and their lungs are pretty functional, but these cells aren't yet and they can't produce surfactant. And so their lungs can't really work, but they just load them up with artificial surfactant and boom, they can survive. It's obviously not that simple, but this artificial surfactant has saved uh, lots and lots of lives of, of prematurely born children. So type two cells pr produce surfactant. The third kind of cell I want you to know are these macrophages. These are a type of immune cell that migrate to the alveoli. And what they do is they capture any dust particles, uh, virus, bacteria, any kind, of, uh, any kind of particle that you don't want in there and they remove it. And so they can break it down via uh, enzymes or they just kind of uh, phagocytize it and then move it out of your lungs. So once stuff gets to the alveoli, it's not moving back up through your airways and then up into your trachea and out that way. At that point, it's kind of stuck down there, but we have these specialized immune cells called macrophages that help clear it out. Did I answer your question? Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, I have a build up, like your secondary question now. So I know some things can't be removed though, like if you're a smoker, mm -hmm. like tar. So do you know like mm -hmm. what the level is of things that can't be removed versus can be removed? In terms of size or? I size and like what causes a particle like tar to not be able to be removed mm -hmm. versus something like that. So a couple of things to consider, it has to do with the size of the particle. It has to do with the number of particles, right? Because if you breathe in, if you're working in a coal mine, you're breathing in dust all the time. Uh, it just overwhelms your body's ability to deal with it. Whereas if you very occasionally breathe in some dust, you can deal with it. Also has to do with the quality of the particles. And I don't know exactly the chemistry behind that, but something like tar or other substances that are, are will adhere to the cells or things like that are just harder to remove for that reason. So I'm assuming once the yeah. like, entire sac is covered, then it kind of dies away because there's nothing live Yeah, it, and it, or it just becomes non-functional and, and air can still move in and out, but it, there's no gas exchange. Or, or the ability, efficiency of gas exchange is greatly reduced. And I'm gonna actually show you a video of that in just a second with uh, smoker's lung. 
Um, so we have all these alveoli. Now what's missing from this diagram, what's super important is to know that they are super closely associated with these tiny capillaries, right? And you can see that here, all these alveoli are surrounded by these elastic fibers that provide the elastic recoil when they are inflated. But then note that all of this is covered in this dense capillary web. And that's because that's where uh, the gas exchange happens. I'm gonna show you that in a little more detail here and then show you a couple of videos. So we've got this, if we blow this up and look at a microscopic level, here is an alveoli that's kind of cut through. You can see these type one alveolar cells, these simple squamous cells making up the, the border of the um, alveoli. The type two cells you can see kind of scattered throughout. Remember those are the, the cuboidal epithelia. They don't look very cuboidal here, but they're secreting that surfactant. Um, and then here you can see close association with the capillary. So this is a capillary that's cut transversely, it's kind of coming at you. You can see gas only needs to move across this very small, small um, layer here. This one layer of the endothelium of the capillary and then one layer of that type one alveolar cell and gas is exchanged. The other cell is these macrophages. These guys are moving around, picking up this debris or a potential um, pathogens and get rid of them. So the, are these kind of like the, the other macrophages? Are those kind of like our only immune cells that are existing kind of outside the body? Well, no, you have immune cells in your digestive tract, for example, and stuff like that. So no, I wouldn't say that technically, because technically your digestive tract is, is external to your body, although obviously that's different from being on your skin or something like that. So no, and you have, you have immune cells on your surface of your skin and mucous membrane and stuff like that too. Mm -hmm. A stroke? Yeah, no, stroke is a blockage of, of the blood vessels in your brain. So, so like start, a, clock. Yeah. a clock can start in almost anywhere in your body, really, but generally in a smaller um, blood vessel. And then if it travels and blocks a blood vessel that is feeding your brain, for example, that's a stroke or one of the blood vessels that's leading to your heart can be a heart attack or something. Mm -hmm. um, let me see here. Kind of covered this already, but actually I don't think I mentioned these alveolar pores yet, is that the, uh, all of these, this kind of grape-like clusters are connected by these pores so that they inflate um, together, more or less. I'm not gonna get into the details of how that works. We'll save that for physiology. They're surrounded by these elastic fibers, as I mentioned, that provide some recoil when they're inflated. And all of this surface area is where these alveolar macrophages roam around those immune cells. Let's wrap things up and talk a little bit about disease. And specifically, I wanna talk about the chronic obstructive pulmonary disease or COPD and two kind of forms of that. One is chronic bronchitis and one is emphysema. COPD kills a lot of people in the US. This slide says it's the third leading cause. It might be the fourth now. I made this slide before COVID. So I think COVID, I don't actually know exactly what the numbers are. Point is it's killing a lot of people, right? And this can happen um, in a couple of different ways. And it's kind of, it's important to know uh, the difference. And it can be caused by, for example, tobacco smoke or air pollution. And what can happen on one hand, we get chronic bronchitis. This is the, when your, your, your bronchi are continually irritated and inflamed. So they're constantly being uh, abraded by these particles. They're constantly uh, having this kind of perpetual immune response. And what happens then is you get excess mucus production in response to this, and you kind of get this constant cough. You're always coughing, coughing, coughing because you've got all of this fluid in your lung. And what can happen is that, um, that fluid can obstruct those airways. It can get in the alveoli and restrict gas exchange. It can also lead to an increase in the rates of infection. On the other hand, I mentioned this connective tissue surrounding the alveoli. If that connective tissue breaks down, what happens is uh, you lose elasticity in your lungs. And so when you inhale, you can, still, you can still fill your lungs with just as much air, 
but then it's really difficult to get that air back out when you're, when you're exhaling. And that seems like it maybe shouldn't be a big deal, but if your body is constantly having to work extra hard just to push air back out of the system, it can actually really restrict your gas exchange and make inefficient uh, the whole process and can lead to essentially just an oxygen uh, deprivation over the long term. And we can see what this looks like um, in, in uh, normal lung versus emphysema. You see here, you see that these alveolar walls are just broken down and even though maybe the volume inside here is the same, the amount of surface area for gas exchange is limited and also that ability of those lungs to recoil is greatly diminished. So don't smoke, it's bad. Stake away message. Uh, I'm gonna show you what this looks like in video form here. Well, here's actually, this one doesn't show you the emphysema lung, but let me just show you this one first. So this is an actual human lung that's been removed and then is being inflated artificially. But I think it's really important to see how much it can expand and what its expansion looks like. All right, so um, that's not covered with the respiratory system. Just very general, just the anatomy of those alveoli, very general stuff, most of what uh, the detail we can get into is we'll save for phys physiology. Can a question? Yeah, so like, say that you're recovering from lung cancer, mm -hmm. or like you're trying to quit smoking, does mm -hmm. like all that black bar just stay there? Or so like, how does it like work? Good question. Uh, your lungs can get better and heal over time, but some of the damage is permanent. Exactly how much of it is is can get healed just depends on how severe it was, how long of a time period you smoked or you know and what your age and all that kind of stuff so i don't know exactly but it can get better at least somewhat so the black part just like stays and you can um some of it can go over time but it takes a while i don't know exactly okay. how much yeah but if your lungs look like that I and mean, if you're smoking a pack a day for 20 years your lungs are gonna have tar in them like that's not gonna go but if you you know decide to try smoking for a week when you're 17 and you're quit then you're probably just fine you know so don't, i'm not recommending that don't take that the wrong way right now when you're in high school you know you gotta try that out at some point in the back of the bus questions all right peeps that's what i got uh let me get your ticket out just a couple reminders about our schedule first of all boom do what oh, here we go let's see oh, my slides aren't working there we go no there we go. Do your course evaluations. I looked yesterday and the response rate for this class was like 30-ish percent. So please make sure you do your evaluations for me and for all of your classes. Super important. Again, I really uh, would appreciate it a great deal if you filled those out uh, completely and honestly. Otherwise, end of semester schedule. Remember that we've got um, quiz number six tomorrow during your lab time. It will start right at the beginning of lab. So please be prompt. Oh, actually, we don't start to kick it out yet. You're gonna be distracted while I do announcements. I'm gonna block the QR code for a second. Um, don't, yeah, just hold on one second. Let me make sure you get this information so you have it. Um, remember the lab will be open until 7 a.m. on Friday this week. So please don't plan on studying Friday morning for the lab practical. I will meet, need that time to set it up. Remember also that Chase is holding two tutoring sessions this week, one online tomorrow night from 6.30 to 8.30 on Zoom and one Thursday afternoon in the lab room. Good chance to review for your practical on Friday. There is a lab practical study guide available in visible body for you. It's at the bottom there. It goes through lab by lab, all the structures you need to know and what you need to know them on. And then finally, remember tomorrow, quiz six is closed book. It covers the lymphatic immune and endocrine systems. Uh, and the questions are multiple choice or fill in the blanks or like diagram labeling. So no long answer questions, um, but you will have some like open-ended questions where you have to like Basically, there's a diagram. I'll tell you what it is right now. There's a diagram. I'm pointing to stuff and I say, what's this? So make sure you know those structures for the lymphatic immune and endocrine systems. And a great thing to study for that is the diagrams that I do for the review at the beginning of class for your tickets out. Those are those. If you study those diagrams, then you'll ace uh, that part of the quiz uh, tomorrow. Otherwise, I have one other announcement. Um, oh, remember, I have open hours today from noon to two. If you have any questions, just stop by the lab room. Okay, you can do the ticket out now. Great, thanks. Mm -hmm. um, is the content today going to be on 